measurement side of things. Good. And so that'll be really good today. Um, and then how about, a, how about more on the physical property measurement side, the PMS side, great. And there you're probably doing things like electric transport, heat capacity, et cetera, yeah. Great, so that's good. Now hopefully this talk is very useful for you. The general theme of this talk is going to be going from bulk, so big chunks of stuff. So this is a heat capacity puck. I don't, I don't know what these samples are, I can't remember. Thermal transport puck, our, our, our resistivity, our electric transport puck. This is just the palladium standard for, for magnetometry here. And I'm gonna be, I'm the magnetism guy at quantum design. So I'm gonna be primarily focused on our magnetic property measurement systems. But if you got other questions, feel free to reach out. I'm gonna be scanning the audience for hands. If I don't see you, uh, Yelp or something, and I'll, I'll be sure to, 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 to answer your questions. I, I like interruptions during. I feel like I'm a little hot. Am, am I a little loud? No, fine, that's great. So we're gonna be going from the bulk and that's where we're gonna be spending most of our time. And then we're gonna transition in the last quarter of the talk or so to the nano scale of it. And I'm gonna be talking about a lot of things that quantum design provides that you probably don't even associate with quantum design, things that we've launched just in the past few months. So that'll be something new hopefully for you. So a little bit of the old, a little bit of the new, and uh, yeah, let's get going here. So as far as magnetic measurement properties are concerned, again, I sort of need a theme here. I'm gonna use frequency or time scales as my outline. And we're gonna start off at the DC limit. So we're gonna be increasing the measurement frequency or decreasing the, uh, the, the, the time of the measurement, if you will. And we're gonna start off here at the DC limit. Things like our magnetic property measurement system, the MPMS-3 in this case, or the VSM for our PPMS. And anytime you see a little icon or image that looks like this, it means that there's a video on our YouTube channel. So if there's something that you take from this talk, uh, if there's only one thing that you take from this talk, it's please go to our YouTube channel, subscribe to it, like and subscribe as they say. This is, not a, this is not a monetized channel. We don't get any money for this. We don't have nearly enough views. But over the past few years, we've really tried to hone what we put on here. Those of you, you know, you get somebody new in the lab. They want to know heat capacity. There's a 45 minute talk on heat capacity because we know none of you want to read the manuals. That just doesn't happen. <laughs> we'll ask you if you're going to read the manuals, but none of you want to do it. Um, TTO, thermal transport option, that, that, that the other application scientists made, that get a buck out of popcorn because that is an hour and a half long video on TTO, right? But it's sort of three measurement options in one. So it sort of makes sense that that has to be long. Um, so again, please go there. Service videos as well are on, on our YouTube channel. A lot of good stuff there. But let's just start with simple DC magnetometry. And let's take a little history trip first. So quantum design was founded in 1982. It's about as old as I am. And our first product was the MPMS, the Magnetic Property Measurement System. This is actually a picture of it right here. 1984, the first product came out. There's probably a few of you in this audience here that used this generation of product. The generation of product I used when I was a graduate student at UC Davis was this one here, the MPMS XL, in which we introduced this reciprocating sample uh, option, which uh, dramatically increased the sensitivity of, of the magnetometer. So again, this is a squid-based magnetometer being able to measure the DC moment down to, well, with the latest generation, down to 10 to the minus eight EMU. And then in a parallel universe, we developed the PPMS and we developed a VSM for the PPMS in 2003. And we developed this linear transport motor that's very useful. And the engineers at Quantum Design, actually our founder was like, hey, can we do the best of both worlds? Can we do VSM with a squid? And that's when the squid VSM was developed in 2006. Um, we actually also made another change to the squid. We went from a RF squid, which has one Josephson junction, to a DC squid, which has two Josephson junctions. And that's actually in the original logo. You can see the little Josephson junction uh, little logos there. And this just had the VSM mode, but people really love this DC extraction mode to get their moments. So in 2013, we brought the DC scan mode back and we developed the MPMS3, which is the latest and greatest generation of magnetic property measurement system and what, what I'll be focusing on today. So why the MPMS-3 compared to the older generation? The key word here is speed. I mean, this thing is a, it's a Ferrari compared to the old system. You can now ramp the magnetic field up to 700 Ersted per second. That doesn't mean you should measure it ramping the, the field that fast, right? Just like if you have a Ferrari, you need to know how to drive it. We've all seen you know, YouTube videos of somebody <laughs> with a Ferrari. They either end up in a ditch or wrapped around a tree. So that's why I'm here is to teach you how to drive your Ferrari. Um, sample temperature, much faster. Again, maybe you don't wanna measure this quickly, but if you wanna get from room temperature down to 1.8 Kelvin, you can do that now in 25 minutes. Whereas before it used to take over an hour and a half. 
And this is because the sample chamber is much smaller and we've got better at cooling things. And DC scan speed, just measurements so much faster. Those of you that use the old system, the DC scan mode, you remember setting up scans, which maybe had 32 points or so, would take about 20 seconds. Now we can measure 10 times as much data in the same amount of time. And each one of these scans, it looks like a continuous line, but actually contains hundreds of data points. If you can fit this better, you can calculate the moment more accurately. So again, speed is the operative word here with the MPMS3. Let's talk a little bit more about how this DC scan mode works. So if the brain of the MPMS3 is the squid sensor itself, we don't have time to go into how a squid sensor works here. For, for today, just think of it as a black box that's a very sensitive to voltage transducer. So that's the brain of the system. The heart of the system is the second order gradiometer shown here schematically, which is basically a coil of superconducting wire. That's important. Say so we have a counterclockwise winding here, two clockwise windings here, and a counterclockwise winding here. Total number of windings is zero, but they're oriented in such a way that when we scan a sample through here, we get a voltage profile that looks something like this. We can then fit this voltage profile using, this is like Cattell level, you know, magnetostatic sort of uh, stuff here. We can fit this voltage profile. This is actually the old, uh, some old data here. This part of the technology has not changed through the, through the generations. This, this equation still fits. And then through calibration constants, you calculate the moment. That's basically how this works, the DC scan mode. Been doing it since 1982. Do it better now, but it's, it's basically the same thing. What I wanna spend a little bit more time talking about is my favorite measurement mode, which is the squid VSM mode, this sort of hybrid mode. So in this case, we've got the same voltage waveform, but instead of scanning the sample through the gradiometer, we just jiggle it in the middle. So we don't need to worry about all of this waveform. We just need to worry about this portion here, which looks a lot like a parabola, doesn't it? Right, so we know that the voltage profile has this parabolic sort of feature, and we know how we move the sample through there. Our voltage profile now looks like this. There's two important features that I want you to take from this. One is that the voltage now is at twice the frequency of the oscillation. So for every physical oscillation of the sample, it goes, let's say, up, down, up. The voltage goes up, down, up, down, up. It changes at twice the frequency. That's sort of also, we try to schematically represent this here. The blue line here is the, the physical oscillation of the sample. The green line is the, the voltage response. This is great from a measurement standpoint because noise would probably occur mostly at the fundamental frequency, but we're not looking there. We're looking at two omega. That's great. The other neat thing about this is the amplitude comes in with the square. That means that the squid VSM mode has a huge dynamic range. We can measure moments as low as 10 to the minus eight EMU, up to 100 EMU, a little bit higher. So that's like 10 orders of magnitude. And we get that through this A squared dependence. Question. So the centering is very critical here, right? Correct, yes. Is there a new way of centering the sample or still the old way? No, so, so the old way you got centering almost for free because you'd scan through the entire gradiometer and you could shift that location. And as long as things didn't move too much, you were fine or the waveform was fittable. Here, you basically have to calibrate the system. We calibrate it at the factory for a set of sample holders, and you can also do a user calibration. Basically, you put a, a sample with a, with a strong moment, because we don't care at this point, and we measure that with DC scans, and then we're able to basically on the fly for a VSM measurement, calculate the true center location based on that. And then the system stores that. And that's very important, because for instance, as you change temperature, as we all know, things thermally expand and contract. Right? And these, sense, these measurements are very sensitive on the, the center position of the sample in that gradiometer. So in a VSM measurement, the system is actually able to calculate uh, the center location on the fly. And it does so at regular intervals. And it does it based on the temperature in the sample chamber. And actually, actually it's, it's, it's getting into the weeds a little bit. It's not only the temperature at the sample location, but a little bit away. And we take a weighted average of them to actually calculate what the true center location is. But yeah, very good question. We don't get... Right, we're not measuring the voltage of the function of space. So how do we know where the center is, right? We're just measuring the voltage using a lock-in amplifier. So a little bit of comparison here. The old generation uh, uh, MPMS uh, sensitivity levels on the order of micro EMU. The RSO was able to improve that to better than a micro EMU. And the MPMS3, not only because of the way we measure, but the fact that we went to a DC squid uh, dramatically improve the sensitivity limit. The VSM mode always beats out the DC scan mode. And another nice thing about the VSM mode, again, we can measure up to 100 EMU or so. 
DC scan mode is limited to about two EMU or so. Uh, yeah, so again, if you can measure using the squid VSM, we encourage you to do that. Sometimes it's not beneficial though. For instance, some of our sample holders maybe have like loose components on them. Or if your sample is mounted a little bit loose, you don't wanna be jiggling it. You wanna just move it through slowly. So these are exceptions to the case. But again, you can do both with the system. All right, so another way that squid VSM mode is nice is it's insensitive to squid drift. So the squid voltage actually drifts around. We're only really interested in changes in that voltage. And linear drifts we can handle. And on short enough time scales, anything's linear, right? But there's this weird situation that we get that when you scan the magnet in unidirectional steps at around 1,000 to 2,500 Ersted, the magnet, due to flux changes in the superconducting magnet, affect the squid non-linearly. And this just messes up the DC scan mode. We can't account for non-linear squid drift. So basically the squid VSM mode doesn't care about nonlinear squid drift. We're not looking at the DC squid voltage. We're only looking at this AC component at twice the frequency in which we're jiggling the sample around. So this is just a, an example of this at work. The, uh, the blue data is measured using the DC scan mode. And again, in this around a thousand or said, and it depends on the system a little bit and the details of the magnet, just all this noise. And this is just due to nonlinear squid drift. But the VSM mode, completely insensitive to the nonlinear squid drift because we're using lock-in detection to only look at that voltage signal, right? So one of the benefits of doing an AC measurement. Another nice thing about the squid VSM mode, because you're just moving the sample over small amplitudes, right? we design our sample chambers so the temperature and field as uniform as possible, but nothing's perfect. Superconductors are particularly good sensors of non-uniform temperature and field profiles. And for DC scan mode, particularly in the old system where you'd move it over the, about four centimeters or so, you might get weird behavior in your superconducting transitions. And that's kind of shown here. In the blue data here is a, is a, this is just the superconducting transition of indium. It shows this weird little kink here. And if we actually look at the squid, uh, the, the fit parameter, it just tanks. Basically, we're not able to fit uh, the DC scan very well in this region here. However, the VSM mode shown in red up here shows a much sharper, nicer transition because we're always moving the sample in that much more of a uniform field and temperature profile. So we don't have to worry about that stuff as much. So again, another nice added benefit of the squid VSM mode. But as was said earlier, very sensitive to the center location. So you gotta make sure you get you nail that down. Question. Can you control the uh, physical amplitude of the oscillation? We can, yes, from okay. 0.1 millimeters up to eight millimeters. So generally for like large moments, you wanna use as small of an amplitude as possible. So you get as small of a voltage because our electronics will rail. And then for very low moments, we encourage that biggest amplitude, which is eight millimeters in this case. Yeah, I guess because you're, I mean, one way to think about this too is if you have an inhomogeneous magnetization profile, you're yep. averaging over it, right? Correct, that as well. Uh, but yeah. Yeah. Is that something you set in the sequence? Yes, yeah, that's just, it's purely, the one thing you can't set with the squid VSM mode is the frequency of the oscillation. So that's a question we get quite a bit because if you go back to a few slides, the voltage doesn't depend on the frequency. You can scan it through because it's a superconducting coil. Um, and what we do, because again, theoretically, it does not depend on, 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 the, on the vibration amplitude, but, or sorry, the frequency. But as we all know, there's different noise contributions, there's line frequencies. So we try to stay away from a few key frequencies and we tune that at the factory to try to find the best frequency for your system. But then you don't get to change it. Unless you think that, you know, you put the thing next to something that's emitting something. We, we've had to do this with customers and then retune it, but then you, you keep it there. You don't have that ability to tune the frequency. What, do you know what roughly that frequency is? It's on the order of 10 to 20 Hertz. So it's a reg relatively slow jiggle. All right, let's go on to the Dynacool or any PPMS to be, to be honest with you, but Dynacool is sort of our flagship PPMS now and the VSM option. And how does that differ from what I just talked about with the MPMS3? So here we've got a first order gradiometer and it's made of just copper wire, okay? Counterclockwise windings up here, as many counterclockwise down here, clockwise up here, as many windings in each, total number of windings are zero and we vibrate the sample in the middle. Now I did this sort of slowly here. Typical amplitudes and frequencies are two millimeters and 40 Hertz. These you can tune in our system you know, for the VSM. We don't recommend tuning the, the, the frequency of the, of the oscillation because it is, you know, we've got filters and stuff in there. 
no more than five to 10 Hertz or so. But so that's not very useful. And then the amplitude you can change up to about five millimeters or so down to 0.1 millimeters. Again, depending on uh, the, the, the strength of your moment. Um, let's see what a VSM coil set uh, looks like. You take the, uh, the clothes off of it here. So we've got the gradiometer here. Again, just copper wire. This is a calibrated Cernox thermometer. We try to get it as close to the sample location as possible, but we don't want it right there either. Because then we're gonna, you know, we could possibly see some of it, even though it's not vibrating, but we could maybe, it might affect things. So we keep it a little bit farther away. Um, and then this is just coupled to a lock-in amplifier. And we're looking at this generated AC voltage, which has this form here, just used basically Faraday's law. So now we see that the voltage depends, of course, on the moment. The amplitude linearly, not with the square, depends on the frequency now, and of course has the time dependence here. And then through calibration constants, we can report the moment in EMU, or as we're seeing more push from the community in SI units. So we can do both. I just can't get away from EMU. I just personally, I just, I just know it, right? But anyways, trying to learn amp meter squared a little bit more. So again, this is how this differs from the MPMS3. We've got two different coil sets. We've got our standard coil set, which has a six millimeter bore. Ideally, you want to keep samples to less than four millimeters in any dimension. Um, has a sensitivity, round numbers here, on the order of six to 10 to the minus seven. So you lose about an order of magnitude from the MPMS3. We also have a large bore coil set that we had to develop for folks because they wanted to put pressure cells in here. People really like mounting samples in straws because they learned that from the MPMS3. You can do straws in here. Uh, but you lose some sensitivity as well. This is just the cost of increasing the bore here. But again, if you want to put one of our pressure cells or some people make their own custom DAX uh, to put in here, generally you need the large bore pressure cell, which has a 12 millimeter diameter. So again, I just talked about two different systems. Which one do I use? So common to both systems, the pressure cells we sell, which are uh, hydrostatic pressure cells. They go up to 1.3 gigapascals. We have sample holders, which allow you to illuminate the sample with light. We have an oven option, which can extend the temperature range up to 1,000 Kelvin. This is identical between systems. If you can get away with micro EMU type of sensitivities and you want to be able to ramp the temperature and field, the VSM is the, is the tool for you, right? A lot of you don't need to push the limits of the, the moment sensitivity. But if you need that extra two orders of magnitude or so in sensitivity, you really got to use the MPMS3. Couple extra ben benefits of the MPMS3. We do have an in situ uh, sample rotation option. It does have a relatively large background, so you shouldn't be able to expect to use the rotator and measure a moment accurately at 10 to the minus eight EMU. But if you got to rotate a sample in situ, we do have an option for this. Or you do like I did as a graduate student and just put them in straws and incrementally rotate them. But you know, we were expected to spend all night in the lab anyways. But anyways, we have a more automated version for this. We also have the ability to do ultra low fields. Superconducting magnets, which are common to both systems. This is a fixed magnet of seven Tesla. The Dynacool can go up to 14 Tesla and our other PPMS can go up to 16 Tesla. Great at producing large fields. Horrible at producing small fields accurately. But the MPMS3, we have a way to compensate these weird uh, remnant fields of the superconducting magnet. And then we just use a common superconducting, very simple solenoid be able to change the field on the order of plus minus 30 Orsted. So you, can, you don't have to worry about remnant fields. This is good if you're setting, let's say a ferromagnet that's very soft, has a very low uh, coercivity. Um, that can be a challenge with a superconducting magnet that you can do here. We also have an option for the MPMS3, which extends the temperature range down to 0.42 uh, Kelvin. It's called the iQuantum Helium-3. It's basically Helium-3 system. Here you can only use AC scans and AC measurements. I'll talk about AC measurements a little bit later. In fact, that's the transition now into AC measurements. So let's go up in the frequency scale a little bit. Milliseconds, microsecond range, our AC susceptometer. And we'll just generally talk about AC susceptibility, which is great for measuring spin glasses, super paramagnets, superconductivity, just to mention a, a, a few here. So again, we have AC options for both systems. Just talk about them generally. So DC moment, we're only interested in, and we can only measure, the length of the magnetization vector, moment vector, as a function of temperature and field. So just a little zoo of different types of DC moments here. But with an AC measurement, what we do is we excite the sample with a drive field of a known amplitude and frequency. We define the phase as zero here. 
And then we just see what the moment or magnetization does in response to this AC field, hence AC susceptibility. Generally speaking, it'll have some phase lag and it'll have some amplitude. And these are the two parameters we're interested in. We use lock-in techniques to measure them, right? So if we're thinking in terms of amplitude and phase, basic math here, we can also think in terms of a real component, or sorry, an imaginary component, a real component and an imaginary component, typically called chi prime and chi double prime. Just a little behind the scenes here, our systems intrinsically measure chi prime and chi double prime. And then through the just very simple trigonometric relations here, we calculate the amplitude and phase. This can be important if you're doing background subtraction. But to intrinsically measure these, we get these. So when you're doing an AC measurement now, now we care about the phase or the out of phase component. That tells you a lot about losses in your system, et cetera. Let's take a look at a few examples of AC susceptibility at work. So again, a spin glass, you got the AC, uh, this the real component here is a function of temperature. You get this cusp. People are often interested in the frequency dependence of this cusp that tells them about how their, their, their spin glass temperature, the dynamics involved here. Um, taking a look at this. So this allows you to do this, something you can't do with DC magnetometry. Super paramagnetism, studying the blocking temperature of these super paramagnetic mm -hmm. nanoparticles. And of course, superconductors are the, the main example, right? Superconductors, especially if they've got a very small critical field, maybe you don't want to apply a DC field to be able to study them, right? But you want to apply just a small AC field to study them and zero DC field. So just, you know, just a very typical, I'm not even sure what, what, what material this is here, but you can look at the real and imaginary components. If we just focus on one here, you of course see the TC, um, the drop it goes to in normalized units here to negative one, perfect diamagnetism. We often get a little peak here in the, in the, in the high double prime. People can use this to study vortex dynamics in their materials, et cetera, by looking at the width of this, et cetera. So again, you get a lot more information out of an AC measurement and you do a DC measurement generally. But I will say that they complement each other well. You really, usually to understand something, you should be doing both uh, techniques. Single molecule magnets also benefit from AC susceptibility. They're often interested in looking at the real and imaginary components as a function of frequency here. So this is measured in a Dynacool from 10 Hertz all the way up to 10,000 Hertz and looking at the dynamic processes of these type of uh, systems. And so part, which one to use? The yes. bottom part is from the AC units. This one here? Yes, ACMS2 for the Dynacool, yeah. How high is the, what's the frequency limit in the swing? We'll get there here. <laughs> Which one to use? So, this that was the next thing. So on the MPMS3, we can only go up to 1,000 hertz, but we can go a little bit lower. It can go down to 0.1 hertz. Round numbers here, five times 10 to the minus eight is the sensitivity EMU. We need to be able to swing the moment around that much to be able to see it. Nice thing about this system, we can technically measure up to a thousand Kelvin. I say technically because it uses our oven heater sticks, which use a copper foil around them as a radiation shield. Whenever you introduce metal into an AC measurement and you apply an AC magnetic field on something that's conductive, what do you get? You get eddy currents. And that can sort of add a background and sort of uh, uh, can mess up some of the interpretation. So I would say low frequency AC measurements up to a thousand Kelvin are very doable on the Dynacool system, the ACMS2, uh, at least at 10,000 hertz, our sensitivity is actually better than the squid-based system, but we do lose an order of magnitude and sensitivity for each decade decrease in frequency. But we also have a larger upper range here on the, on the, uh, on the, on the, on the, the ACMS2 for the Dynacool here. We can go up to 10 kilohertz. Um, again, here we can decrease the, the, uh, the, the measurement temperature down to 0.42 Kelvin with the iQuantum helium-3. But here, I would say the Dynacool wins out if we want to go even lower temperature because we do have an AC susceptometer for a dilution refrigerator insert. So we can do, do AC susceptometry down to 50 millikelvin with the ACDR option. So again, all these things, the, the, the story here is you got to have both systems, right? That's what I'm saying. But no, you don't have to. But if you can't have both systems, think about what your measurement parameters, what, what you really need here, because they really do complement each other well. And in fact, uh, this was actually one of my first little projects. We had uh, Sylvan Demir, she's, I think up now in Michigan now. Uh, she had an MPMS3 and she was doing, she was looking at, she does a lot of single mo molecule magnet stuff. And she's looking at as a function of frequency, the real and imaginary components. And basically as she would increase temperature, she ran out of bandwidth here. This feature or this peak here, she just couldn't go. So we took the sample to quantum design, 
measure, and then we're able to measure up to 60 Kelvin or so, because now we can measure up to 10,000 Kelvin. And basically we're able to stitch these two data sets together to be able to do this. Um, unfortunately, due to the bandwidth of the squid, we just can't go faster than 1,000 Hertz in the MPMS3. The squid just can't react fast enough. All right, going up further in frequency. This isn't so much for this crowd, but I have to include it because I've got, a, I've got, a, I've got a, an outline here to go through. But now we're entering the realm of, of, of coherent precession, things like fMR, ferromagnetic resonance, and spin waves as we go up into the gigahertz or nanosecond uh, range. Uh, we can study dynamic properties like the effective magnetization, gyromagnetic ratio, uh, magnetic damping, uh, inhomogeneous broadening. We can study things like exchange stiffness and something called the inverse spin hall effect. Again, maybe not so much uh, for this crowd here, but we do. Uh, we partnered with a company in Sweden uh, that makes uh, spectrometers, FMR spectrometers, and they sell two variants of it, one for room temperature in which you bring your own electromagnet and power supply, and ones that work with the entire suite of, of PPMS product lines, the, the, the standard PPMS, Dynacool, and Versalab, and their respective temperature and field ranges. And we have a special probe that allows you to study ferromagnetic resonance, primarily of thin magnetic films, ferromagnets in general. I have a question. Yes. Here it is, Helmholtz coil. Yes. What is the heat load? It's not negligible, which is one of the reasons why the base temperature of this probe is a little bit higher than the base temperature of the system for two reasons. FMR, we need to pump a decent amount of energy into the system. One is to the Helmholtz coil. So we don't have time to go into the details, but this Helmholtz coil does is it modulates the magnetic field. We've got the probe horizontally here, but the DC magnetic field would be along this direction. And in order to use a lock-in measurement, we need to jiggle something. So we so jiggle I, the AC I, field. I you see DC, DC field is being generated by superconducting yeah, light. Exactly, yeah. So heat load. Yep. But the Helmholtz coil is you are running a DC current through a copper wire. Yep, yeah, exactly, yeah. What is the wattage? That's what I want. Uh, enough to raise the base temperature up by a few degrees. Two degrees? Hmm? Well, so around five Kelvin or so. But it also depends on the RF power that you pump in to the system from the spectrometer. That also heats up the system. So both of these compete. The coil by itself, we run it at, uh, I think I've gone through this calculation. It's on the order of a few milliwatts or so. But that's the cooling power of a Dynacool is on the order of five to 10 milliwatts at base temperature or near base temperature, technically base temperature. So we have been with this, you know? If you want to generate, let's say, with the Helmholtz coil, a field of about 50 gauss. Yeah, that ain't going to happen with this. You'll burn it out. Yeah, yeah. a lot of current. Right? Yes, exactly. All, yep. all your heating. Yep, and you've, 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 yeah, you've generated a heater down there. Yeah, so, but you also wouldn't want to do that for at least this type of experiment because then you would broaden out your resonances. You want to keep that AC modulation field as small as possible. But you're right. Yeah, no, that's one of the, the costs of doing business is at cryogenics is dealing with these heat loads. One nice thing about the MPMS3 is it actually has a modulation coil built into the superconducting magnet, okay. which is kind of nice. But there you do have to be careful. You don't want to juice more than about 500 milliamps in that, because if you burn that coil out, now you're buying a superconducting magnet as well. So that would be pretty, burning this one out is a little bit safer. But anyway, best contact your local application scientists who can help you out with these things. This is a, is a complex uh, parameter space one needs to work in. Little announcement, again, quantum design doesn't get any money from this, but Springer does. If you want a book on magnetic characterization techniques, a lot of good content in here. I think it's chapter three. Myself and Tom Hogan, the other application scientist, wrote a whole chapter on squid magnetometry. A lot of good stuff on AC susceptibility, FMR, et cetera, in this book. So just a little quick announcement on this. Going up further in frequency, let's say we're going to the terahertz regime. Now we need to start thinking about exciting our samples with light. Any of you with a PPMS know it's a pain to get light in and out of that system, right? It's got a sample chamber of about a of an inch and it's about a meter long. So we developed um, optical. So you, this is if you wanna do things like ultra-fast demagnetization, circular dichroism, any sort of optical experiments, we developed optical. This we developed about four years ago. So it is a magneto-optical cryostat Unlike a PPMS, we don't have any plug and play measurement options for optical. You build your own experiment with this, but we give you the same temperature and feedable sort of comfort as you expect from a PPMS. So we've got lots of optical access. If we take a look at this, we've got seven side ports, one top port. We've got a port down here in the bottom. 
It's trying to give you as much optical access as possible. You can customize all these windows in here, et cetera. Temperature range is 1.7 Kelvin up to 350 Kelvin. So actually goes a little bit colder than a Dynacool, but optical experiments to our point earlier about inducing heat loads tend to induce heat loads. So depending on your experiment, the base temperature might be higher. If you pump a bunch of power in there, it's gonna warm up. We've got a seven Tesla split coil a conical magnet in here that you can kind of see. There's another laser pointer on the table. Computer seems to have froze up slightly. Yep. <laughs> Great. So let's stay. Maybe actually I'll just use the laser pointer here. Just I have a feeling that this is maybe messing things up. Uh, where's my laser pointer? All right, great. So again, seven Tesla split coil conical magnet you can kind of see here, and just a lot of space to work in. Uh, the, the nominal sample volume is now 89 millimeters by 84 millimeters. You got fully automated operation of the temperature and field like you get in a PPMS and it's cryogen free. It actually uses a very similar cooling mechanism as the Dynacool, hence the name Optacool. It's different, but it's also very, very similar. There's basically a, a closed cycle helium refrigerator chugging away in here, keeping everything nice and cold and everything is conduction cooled in here. Um, you also have uh, access to this negative space region down here. We can give you different sample pods so you can really have a lot of room for experiments. Those of you who are used to a PPMS in which you're confined to that one inch diameter bore, again, the, I mean, the operative phrase here is there's just so much more room for activities in an optical for you to design what you need to do. So again, different pod configurations. Uh, we allow for positioners. We work with the Attacube actually on this, depending on your setup, maybe you need to put a positioner on a pod like this or one like this, it's up to you. The idea is, you know, an analogy to a PPMS, you're designing your, your experiment on, we call it a sample pod now, but it's analogous to a puck, if you will. And then that plugs into the system, just like a sample puck would into a PPMS. And then you get access to whatever wiring you have to the outside world through feed throughs. System comes with like DC connections, I think up to like 80 of them. You can also get fiber feed throughs. RF coax lines built into this system. So it's really customizable as well. And these are all different options. And depending on your experiment, the, the working distance is very important. A lot of people wanna do like microscopy in here. Usually they want small working distances for microscopy. So we have various options in which we've modified this top plate. So you can get working distances on the order of one to two millimeters. You get very thin windows, you can get very close. Usually this helps with magnification, et cetera. And I should also mention for microscopy studies, right, that the system is designed to be very low vibration, less than 10 nanometers in any given direction. So that's where a lot of the engineering went into this because you got this cold head, it's a pulse tube cold head chugging away. What do you do to keep those vibrations from making their way to the sample space? So that's basically the cold head suspended, et cetera. It's a very intricate system to get these vibrations away from the sample location. And of course, we have a special standoff if you want access to that bottom port. Not everybody has an optical table with a hole through it. So we can do something like this here so you can get access. Some experiments want to go vertically through the magnet. Um, what does optical look like in the field? I mean, you can see why quantum design cannot at this point provide any plug and play measurement options because I mean, these are complex experiments. Everybody wants something custom. Um, some customers have actually put a, a diamond anvil cell. This is a pressure cell in the system. This is great for an optical system, even if you're doing, let's say, electric transport or something, because you often want to look at the fluorescence of ruby or something to, to actually tell what the pressure is. 
And I don't know what the experiment this person is doing, but they have four positioner stacks on here. So this is something very complicated, but it's, it's again, the idea optical is we're taking care of the temperature and field profile. You're taking care of the experiment. Um, what's some of the science people have been doing with this? Um, just a spattering of, of, of relatively recent papers here. Um, you know, they're doing a lot of MOC, they're doing Raman, uh, a lot of electric transport, Raman, et cetera, photoluminescence, absorption, all sorts of different things on a wide variety of materials. Um, they're also doing, this is something I've just learned about last week, uh, Meng Kun Liu at Stony Brook actually has put, this is unpublished results, but he said I could, I could show them. And I think this is kind of, I'm not exactly sure what his end story is here. We, we have to wait for the paper, but he actually, we're excited about this. He put an atomic force microscope in his optical and is doing AFM at 200 Kelvin and 6.6 .6 Tesla. So I think this is pretty uh, neat and exciting. And it's also a nice segue into the final portion of the talk, which is devoted towards microscopy. So now we're entering, we're approaching the, the nano part, if you will. So in particular, scanning probe microscopy. So what I wanna sort of highlight here is correlated microscopy. What do we mean by correlated microscopy? So this little test sample here, which is not scientifically particularly interesting, but it gets the point across, is a silicon wafer with some gold lines on it and some aluminum oxide lines. So good conductors, semiconductors, bad conductors, et cetera. And what we have here is basically a correlated image of four different techniques. We've got SEM shown here in gray. We've got AFM shown here for the topography, conductive AFM here for the conductive uh, response of the sample. Um, and a lot of SEMs, there are, there is an EDX analysis you can do to do elemental analysis. So we've got four different techniques here. And we actually sell, a lot of people don't know this at Quantum Design, something we call the AFSIM, which is basically an AFM that you can put in almost any SEM to do these kind of correlated studies. Uh, we've been selling this now for about five or six years or so. And we've got a wide variety of cantilevers we can provide for standard topography, conductivity, uh, diamond tips for very hard materials, uh, magnetic force microscopy, et cetera. Unlike a lot of AFMs that you might be familiar with, which are optical, which you actually, you have to shine like a laser on the, the back of a cantilever and you're looking at how this, the cantilever moves. These are self-sensing cantilevers that use piezo resistors and actuators within them. So you don't have to worry about getting light in and out of the SEM, which is why you can actually put this so close to the SEM column here. So this is, I think, pretty interesting. Again, sort of something maybe different that you wouldn't think quantum design would be a part of. And you know, if you don't want to uh, put an AFSIM inside of your SEM, well, just about a few months ago, quantum design um, developed, I'm gonna just skip along here for AFM. Uh, we developed a SEM around an AFSIM. So this is a brand new product. We launched this about three months ago or so. I think it was October, uh, 2022. And basically what this is, it's an AFM with all the conventional modes, contact mode, tapping mode, uh, something called fire mode, finite impulse response, excitation. This is good for studying like soft materials, magnetic force microscopy, conduction AFM, et cetera. And we built our own SEM around this. And what this also enabled us to do is we're able to put the sample on something we call the trunnion and we're able to do some very interesting uh, studies here because Sometimes it's very hard to know where your AFM tip is. So this is actually some data here from uh, Fusion Scope here. So we've got the, the, the AFM here. This is the cantilever. And the tip is gonna be somewhere here. But let's say we have a surface which is very uneven, very rough. Well, what the Fusion Scope allows you to do is basically be able to tilt everything and keep everything in such a way that you can now put your AFM tip or MFM tip or whatever the tip is wherever you want it. And so this is like, we think a very nice feature for, again, correlative microscopy and being able to do it exactly where you want to. Um, it's a quantum design product, meaning we've tried to make things as easy as possible with these different tasks. You want to uh, change the beam voltage, there's a special task for that. If you wanna change AFM tips, there's a special task for this. Everything is very modular and plug and play with fusion scope. Again, the same sort of, you know, user experience that we've tried to learn from MPMS and, and Dynapool, et cetera. And it's got this truly joint coordinate system. So as you're doing SEM work, right, you're imaging, trying to find out what's interesting here, you can basically click and drag your regions of interest and be immediately doing AFM in this case, where you want to, okay? And being able to correlate and combine these two 
images together. And it's not a toy either, I should say. So, you know, it's a, it's a very good AFM. Um, we're able to resolve at single atomic steps in, in, in graphite. Um, so yeah, it's like I said, it works, it works very well. <laughs> there we go. Is that me? A little buggy here. And then it's, I'll finish up on a product um, that's actually not a quantum design product, but quantum design distributes products for other folks. We uh, have a partnership with a company um, in Europe called QNAMI. So this is somewhat related to scanning probe microscopy. It's a scanning NV center microscope. So it looks a lot like an AFM. We've got a, a cantilever, they call it a quantilever, um, and it's got a diamond tip with a single nitrogen vacancy in here. And again, we don't have to go through all the details of how this actually works uh, here, but the general idea is you got this nitrogen vacancy in the diamond, you excite it with green light, you just shine green light on this, it fluoresces back red. You need a little bit more to the apparatus. You need to have a microwave excitation, a microwave field nearby. And if you scan that microwave field, you scan the frequency of that field, you'll get a little dip in the red light. So you get a certain amount of red light out, get to a certain frequency, a little dip. Okay? That's a zero magnetic field. As you increase the magnetic field, you get the Zeeman splitting between these peaks. The distance between these peaks or dips here, I guess, technically, is directly proportional through the applied magnetic field locally. So it's a very sensitive local field sensor. Think of it like if you're scanning a Hall probe around, except much more sensitive than that. Um, compared to MFM, magnetic force microscopy, it tends to have much better lateral resolution. It's much more sensitive than MFM. So MFM works by um, coating a, an AFM tip with a magnetic material, and you're scanning a magnet next to another magnet. And usually, or sometimes, depending, you have to be very careful, the tip can actually affect the sample and vice versa, depending on things. This is just diamond. The tip does not affect the sample, which is a very nice benefit. And you're directly measuring the field. So with MFM, you're measuring forces which are dependent on field gradients. Here, it's, you're just measuring the field, what it is, the local field profile, and along a given direction. So that direction, again, we're getting into the weeds here a little bit, but due to the crystallography of diamond, these vacancies can have different directions. Here we show one where it's at an angle. So we're technically sensitive to both in-plane and out-of-plane field directions, but they provide tips which are just oriented vertically or horizontally, depending on your, on your sample here. And just a few little examples of, of, of the Kunami system at work. Again, very sensitive. Um, if you wanna look at things like anti-ferromagnetic domains, you can do that with this system. Very hard to impossible to do with MFM. Skirmions are, are pretty uh, hot right now in, in certain communities effects in nanowires. Basically, whenever you want to see very small changes in local field profiles, this would be the system uh, for you. And with that, as I conclude the talk, I'll just, you know, I mentioned, uh, what I mentioned, YouTube, you should go there, subscribe. Also subscribe to our, our LinkedIn channel. Uh, we have job, job postings if you're interested. Uh, we're currently looking for an AFM engineer. If you, have, if you know somebody who has AFM experience, we'd be happy to, uh, to consider them. And we're we're actually in a, in a hiring mode right now. So we're often keeping this updated. Just something to keep in, you know, even if not just for the jobs, just, you know, follow us on LinkedIn. We're always posting new things. Um, so yeah, with that, I will thank you for your attention and we'll take any more questions. Thank you. Okay, questions. The last you showed, is there a temperature change? There's, from what I hear, and that's always the question people ask, it's on the way, from what I hear. They are working on it. The good question of what I showed there was just room temperature. It would be, it's not integrated with. No. It would be no. Their own. Exactly, exactly. Yep. Um, so again, for that last system, how well isolated does it have to be? I'd imagine that if you have, a system like this, it's very sensitive to any kind of external magnetic fields. Um, so, like, you know, if I'm walking by it with my keys dangling out of my pocket, am I gonna screw up my measurement or? Um, I've, I've asked I've asked them similar questions. It's it's very robust. We've even had the this thing like working at a at a show, 
Um, and it's because basically at the end of the day, um, you're doing a basically a lock-in technique, I believe, of, of the, the, the response. So, you know, I didn't get into those weeds. Right. So some slow drifts of field and things like that, you're not going to see. But yeah, honestly, if you come up with a big old bar magnets or, I mean, yeah, you, know, oh, yeah. you, would, you, would, you, would, see, you would see that. So. And just like any AFM technique, it is usually best done like in a sound box, you know, vibrations. Um, if it, that's that's at least what they tell me is actually the vibration issues are, or which are common to any AFM sort of experiment tend to dominate. Really, uh, okay. Be more problematic than than the field. Gotcha. Within limits, obviously. But uh, SEM, what kind of uh, spatial resolution do you get with your SEM? Is it a uh, three dimension gun? Or? It is a yes. It's a field emission gun. We're talking tens of nanometers. So it's also a pretty good SEM, you know, it's, it's, it's not, again, we'd be really honest, this is not, you know, one of these big systems that you're going to be doing the world's best EV lithography with, but you, you probably see, you've seen some of these systems like these phenom systems, these people top SEMs are becoming very in vogue now, you know, it's on the order of that or better. So. Sorry, again, for this last system. Um, so how, like, I would imagine that over time, as with any AFM kit, these tips would, would gunk up a little bit and get some debris on them and stuff. Um, how does that affect the performance? And uh, are there ways to correct for it? Or is this the kind of thing where you have to change the tips a lot more frequently? Uh, so what I've, what I've been told is, is basically, you know, this is up to the user and what type of samples they're looking at here. Uh, uh, one of these quantilevers should last a very long time, but if you abuse it, it's 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 going to take a toll. A little bit of gunk, I can imagine a little bit of gunk on there. Again, now I'm not speaking from direct experience. I'm just you know, what I know about science and the way that this technique works. As long as that gunk does not shield the magnetic field, probably the big dominant thing it's going to do is going to change the mass and it's probably going to change maybe the resonant frequencies a little bit. And right. you do that early on. But what I didn't mention is it's very important for this technique, right? Magnetic field, right? The the field changes the R square or sorry R R. R R to the minus three, right? It's a cubic dependence. So it's very sensitive. So basically this thing is operating in a tapping mode sort of geometry in which we were keeping a constant height as much as possible. I see, okay. So Thank we you. should not be contacting the sample. This is not, yeah, you don't wanna be doing contact mode with this type of thing. Gotcha, okay. You approach the sample, you don't actually touch it, right? And then you back off a little bit from there and you do a constant height. Got it. I wanna go left. One last. One ask the last question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll ask the questions. Yeah. Uh, so, how long has this uh, S SPM been on the market? The the one that just goes inside of an SCM, um, I think about four or five years. Uh, we've been selling that, and then the fusion scope, which we then provide the you know we built an SCM around that essentially, and it's got other bells and whistles. That's that is fresh. That is like I said. That is that is October twenty twenty two. If you come in a March meeting, you're going to see a very different kind of quantum design booth this year, and that's going to be the the, the center stage. The stuff, so. And this, uh, for example, on this slide, you have this AFMT integrated with the sensors. Yes. And this. Uh, do you guys make it yourself? Or? No, so this would be a company we distribute for. So part of our business model is we we work with other companies. So for instance, we uh, we sell like some some of these these furnaces and stuff. We don't make those at the factory in San Diego, but we'll partner with other companies because we have a worldwide presence and we sell for them. It also helps us keep our eye on certain technologies. And again, I mentioned I'm sort of the I, magnetism guy at quantum design, so I find this very interesting. So this would be a kind of product that. Yeah, we, 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 we sell for them because they're kind of a smaller company and it's hard for smaller companies, particularly in Europe, to be able to sell worldwide, but we know how to do that. So that's how that sort of partnership works. And this is also, like I said, very fresh. This is, I don't know, maybe summer of, of last year is when we started. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of interest. And I will say the biggest interest, of course, is JP's question, temperature. That's, that's what we're trying to get them, you know, most interested in because that's, I mean, that's the big variable, right? Let's do this. Most of our stuff, unfortunately, doesn't work very well at room temperature, you know. So, right, that the base temperature. I guess. Well, this one's just room temperature right now. They're working on a cryogenic version. So, uh, what uh, is there anything uh, 
coming in the future. Any new instruments, Quanzine is uh, fusion scope wasn't enough. Well, <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's already it's here. Exactly, exactly. I mean, so we are we're we're old, I mean, optical we find very exciting, right? This is also a different parameter space for us. Are we going to maybe try to develop a plug and play type of option? I don't know. Um, different magnetic field configurations, maybe a vector magnet for a system like that. Um, these are the things that we're working on. Is there system. vector magnet options for keeping us? No. no. That's, yeah, that's I, early on, we had a version of PPMS which had a transverse magnet um, and we had a different type of rotator. But honestly, if you have for like electric transport measurements, if you've got a two axis rotator, which is something Personally, I'm interested in maybe quantum design, hopefully developing one day. You almost have a, you basically have a vector, at least for, for electric transport measurements, vector magnet type of capabilities. You're just moving the sample instead of the field. But uh, at least for, for optical, we're finding, you know, all these different, let's just say you're doing MOC, right? There's all these different geometries with MOC. It's useful to be able to have the field change. And, and the large superconducting solenoid, that, that's, that's not moving right now. That's, that's, that's tough. So uh, now most of your systems are dry, right? Correct. And how do you take care of vibration, for example, if you want to do a scanning tunneling microscopy? So somebody, I do know, I don't, I can't remember the research group. Somebody is trying to put an STM in an optical. And again, that's all this, when they developed optical, that was, it was basically the cryogenics quantum design already knew. This is, again, I didn't help develop, I'm telling you the lore that I've been told, right? This has been passed down through generations, right? We know the cryogenics very well. We know how to make magnets pretty well, but that was a challenging magnet for us to make a split coil magnet, especially conduction cooled, because you got to make sure that thing is completely cold and well synced to the cryo cooler. And then the third part of that was the vibrations. Because Dynacool, we don't worry about that vibrations. We often get asked about vibrations, what the vibrations in the Dynacool, because some people want to do optics like experiments. But we even sell an optical multifunction probe for the Dynacool, a little positioner stack, but it's just for very coarse positioning. That's, that's vibrating a lot. And everything's suspended on a sample chamber that's a meter long, that's primarily connected at the top. So, you know, it's just the opposite of like the skyscraper problem where it's moving a lot at the top. So again, the cryo cooler, um, you, you look at the manual, sort of see it's basically on this hexapod sort of anti-vibration system. And let me see, do I have a full picture of optical? Basically what they tried to work on to get the vibrations is right conservation of energy they have to go somewhere and trying to do their best i guess i don't i don't have a complete picture of optical oh well but basically this here is suspended and there's a rod that goes to the floor so the idea is we try to shunt as many of the vibrations this way down to the floor then this way to the sample that's also part of the secret sauce on vibration control in here but it's tough. I mean, it's it's tough, and that's one of the the specs that we guarantee at the factory is the vibration spec because that's for most people, especially anybody who want to do a microscopy experiment. Vibrations are killers, but we can't go to helium, liquid helium anymore. That's as we all know here. That's you know, there's no, there's no going back. I don't think. Okay, last question right there. Yeah, and this is about you. So how what what made how did you end up in quantum design and how does how does that compare to like what you were doing at Universal? Oh man, like personal question, the Randy story. So yeah, that's a good question. Um, so my general story, I uh, I went to undergrad at UC San Diego. I'm from, originally from Northern California. I wanted to get as far away from home as possible, but still stay in California. And Torrey Pines Golf Course is right next to UCSD, so it just worked out very well. I then applied to graduate school. So I did a lot of undergraduate research um, at UCSD and applied to a bunch of graduate schools, only got into one, and I got into UC Davis, which brought me back very close to home. Um, and there I did a lot of work on magnetic reversal mechanisms in nanostructures, magnetic nanostructures. And at that time, I was like, I'm just going to go, I'm going to be an academic. Of course, of course I am. I'm going to be just like my, my advisor, Kai. I'm going to go do a postdoc. So apply for a postdoc. Again, the graduate school brought me very close to home. I wanted to leave again. I went to Sweden for my postdoc, the University of Gothenburg, because I wanted to study magnetodynamics. And actually, full disclosure, I work part-time for Nanos, which is this company that made this FMR spectrometer. Because I was interested now, you know, I sort of did magnetostatics as a graduate student, 
Sweden was a good opportunity to go somewhere. And I encourage you, those of you who are going to go to, you know, postdoc, it's to me, it's sort of like the, 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 the journeyman when you were learning trades. If a graduate student's like an apprentice, postdoc's like a journeyman. Go somewhere else, see something new. But I was warned by a guy at UC Davis, Chuck Fadley, who since passed, he was like, if you leave the country, it's going to be very hard for you to get back here in an academic position. And boy, was he right. Because I, I went to Sweden for two, three year postdoc, and then basically spent five years trying to apply for positions back here in the States. You know, I'd apply, you know, 15, 20, and maybe I get one interview per year. I mean, it was, it was very, very tough. And most of them, you know, I go to these interviews and I'm like, why would you leave Sweden? You know, they had to put Sweden on this pedestal. And don't get me wrong, Sweden was great. Not great actually for academia. It's, it's a very different system than we have here. But again, I was very singular minded. And that was stupid. I was just like, oh, I'm just going to do academia, academia, academia. And then one day, uh, the previous application scientist at Quantum Design, Neil Dilley, we worked together on this FMR probe for the, for the, for the, for the PPMS. He just asked, he's just like, you know, I'm leaving soon. You know, we're going we're gonna to have a, a job opening for an application scientist. And I scoffed at it because, again, closed-minded. So this is also the part of the story. Don't be closed-minded. Keep your options open. Stupid Randy, right? Just closed-minded. I just scoffed at it. But this was also... They wrote a very good job description. And I looked at the bullet points of this job description. I was like, I, I like doing this sort of stuff, like being able to travel, still teach in some format, right? But I don't have to grade anything now, right? I'm like the fun uncle that comes over and he can just give talks. I don't have to be a disciplinarian, right? I get to work with a lot of interesting scientists at quantum design, really smart people. I get to work with people in production, the people actually wind these coils, et cetera. People at all levels of education, right? We've got, you know, high school all the way up to PhD levels at quantum design. And so that was an interesting call. And I did finally get an academic offering at the University of Alabama. At the same week, I got the offer from quantum design. And it was a big, I mean, I just sat there just sort of weighing things. And I was like, I needed a change. And I think it was a good change. I sometimes do miss academia. Um, I don't miss uh, writing grant proposals. I don't miss fighting with referees. I don't, those two things I don't. I don't like, but I do like the teaching, still able to do that. So again, that's, that's, that's why it was just, you know, take a little bit of a chance, you know, probably my chances to go back to academia are probably over. That's probably fine, but it's neat to actually work for somewhere where, you know, as a graduate student, you build an apparatus, you build a thing in the lab. You only really care that that works during your few years in graduate school. It's very different to see people that got to make hundreds of something and they have to actually work to certain specs. And if, they don't work to those certain specs, you will hear about it, right? So it's very different to see that and being able to chug these things out. So that's been very eye-opening as well. So that's a little bit of the Randy story, but it wasn't easy. So again, the main take-home message is keep your options open, right? There aren't, I, you guys had the discussion yesterday about uh, 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 jobs and stuff. I mean, there's just not that many academic positions. They're hard to get, especially if you leave the country. So, uh, but I urge you to also leave the country. I mean, experience new things, so but keep your options open. Thanks. Okay, and subscribe. To the and subscribe, like and smash that like button too. All right, thanks so much, Chris. Okay, one more time before you get lunch, come down. Uh, maybe there's a small, medium, large, and a spark. It's only take one. I would love to hear about it, but I don't want to get in the way. Thank you.